Hi, hello, I am the Cyber Reef Guru. Thank you so much for watching. Today we have another fun and exciting project that I have been working on for longer than I care to admit. So if you are a regular viewer to this channel, you will know that I got the One Infinity new CNC probably a couple months or so ago and I've been using it and I've found it uh, challenging uh, in some regards. And what I mean by that is I am looking for just a little bit more convenience in the setup that I have here in the new office. And so to that end, I wanted fingertip access to a couple of critical functions, very specifically, the ability to turn on and off my shop vac, the ability to turn on and off the spindle without a lot of drama, and then the ability to control other accessories as required. And so I envisioned this CNC control panel, and wouldn't you know it, I was trolling through the forums for the Onefinity, and someone had posted their version of a control panel. Now I looked at it very closely, and I said, well, that's not exactly what I was looking for. It's got a couple features that I didn't need. It's got some things that uh, I did need. Um, and so I thought, well, hey, this design is pretty close to what I was looking for. So let's take this, let's mold it into what I was looking for. And so I started doing that. And as it turns out, I ended up with something that is very specific to my needs, but is also generalizable to just about anyone else. The only difference is you need to create your own enclosure. So all of the insides are, let's just say, uh, standardized so that you can use it for just about any machine. It doesn't have to be a Onefinity. It could be a Shape Oko or an X-Carve or just about any machine, really. So what I would like to do today is walk you through the design in Fusion 360. My original intent was to actually show you the panel built into my cabinet over here, but alas, <laughs> I haven't quite finished it yet. It is over here on the workbench and I am almost done, but I have a couple more tweaks that I wanted to make, but I also wanted to get this video out because I've had it queued up for a really long time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna walk you through the design and then in my next video, I will show you the actual implementation. I will show you the hardware and then I will show you the installation process and how I use it in my workflow. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and cut over to Fusion 360 and I'll show you what I have in terms of the design. All right, so here we are in Fusion 360 and what you see in front of you is the control panel that I designed. So it is more long than it is vertical to fit the specific location that I have over here, which is gonna go on the front of the desk that I've created for the Onefinity. So let's go ahead and talk about what is going on here on the front panel. So on the left hand side of the front panel, you have the general control area. That is where the on and off switches are for the different accessories, which I'll talk about in just a minute. In the center area, this is where we connect the probe for doing your X, Y, and Z probing. On the right hand side here, we have some indicators that show the status of the incoming AC voltage. We have a power switch that controls the entire control unit and an e-stop button. Now down here on the bottom, there's a little place for a USB connector that attaches to the microcontroller that controls this entire unit, which I will talk about in just one moment. So let's go ahead and dig in on the power switches here. So I have a power switch for the control unit itself, which controls uh, for the Onefinity. It's the build botics. It can be any control unit that you want. I have a power switch to turn the spindle on and off. Because this entire unit is controlled by a microcontroller, I can actually attach it to my controller, the BuildBotics in this case, and have the G-code turn the spindle on and off as well as this little power switch. So that's really cool. The other thing I have is the ability to turn the vacuum on and off. Once again, the G-code, as it turns the spindle on, it can also turn the vacuum on because of the microcontroller. And the last little piece here is this accessory. It is a fourth switch. I don't have a particular use that I've determined yet that I'm gonna have for this. I think I'm gonna end up using it for some lighting, but the design itself facilitated uh, four control units or four relays. So uh, I went ahead and I put four switches in and then I'll figure out what I'm gonna use the fourth switch later on. 
Okay, in the center, I mentioned the probing area. What we have is an input here, which is this little jack, where I will actually attach the probe and then attach it to the spindle. And then a little LED here that turns on when the probe makes contact with the um, actual metal piece that you're probing against. And so this is a visual indicator right from the front panel rather than just on the computer screen that the, the end mill has actually hit the probe and has made contact. And then on these power connectors here, or these power indicators, I should say, this actually shows whether or not the incoming AC power is turned on or off. So they could either be plugged in or plugged off, or I will rotate here and show you a little bit. There are on off switches for every one of the input powers so that you can turn them on or off individually. So if for some reason you wanted to kill the power entirely, um, you could just hit this little uh, toggle switch here on the bottom and it'll cut the power, the AC power to the unit. Now back here on the bottom, this is where the output power is plugged in. So you would plug your spindle in or plug your uh, vacuum into this plug here. And then the incoming AC is plugged into these uh, receptacles right there. So I mentioned the power. This power actually turns on the microcontroller and controls the entire unit and controls whether or not there is going to be a control signal sent to the relays here. So that allows the AC input power to be coupled into the output to turn the device on, whether it's the controller, the accessories, the spindle, or the vacuum. Uh, the e-stop switch here, um, I have put the placeholder in the design for the e-stop. I told you that I would talk about this in a minute. And so so uh, I didn't actually end up milling this hole because the ESOP switch I ended up buying uh, is a little um, soft. And what I mean by that is it's, it's a little bit too easy to push in. And so I'm a little bit of afraid where the unit is here that I might brush up against it or I might push up against it and inadvertently push it in causing an e-stop when I didn't want to cause an e-stop. I'm looking for an e-stop switch that is more rigid. It requires a little bit more pressure to push. And so that's something that I'm still digging into, but is part of the design. And so at any point I can cut the hole into the front panel and put that in and then wire it into the system and make it work. So, uh, you know, overall it was just um, that particular switch I purchased is not quite optimal for my use case, but uh, you know, if it were in a more safe area, uh, you know, if it was more vertical or off to the side or something like this, I think it would be okay. But I'm just afraid given how low it is, if I'm leaning over the machine while it's operating, I might hit it with my thigh or with my side or something like this and trigger it. So just being a little safe, don't want to inadvertently ruin <laughs> uh, an operation for or a piece of material or something like this by hitting the stuff by accident. So the USB input here that I have for the microcontroller, I mentioned the microcontroller controls all of the devices here inside of this box. What this is predominantly used for is reprogramming the microcontroller if I want to change the software that's running on it. Um, and also if I need for some reason to look at some of the debug output while it's running for some reason, um, I could do that as well, but it just makes it readily accessible so I don't have to unmount the entire unit, um, essentially disassemble it, go in there and plug a USB cable into the microcontroller. So I just ran a little micro uh, USB extender to the front panel and then I can just plug into the front panel as required when I need to do that. So that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so let's go ahead and show you the, let's take the top off and I will show you what is on the inside. It's fairly straightforward. So what you see here across the bottom are those plugs that I showed you earlier, which is the AC input. Then we have the plugs for the AC output here on the bottom. And then across the back, what we have are a bunch of solid state relays. Now, these I did a lot of research on these relays. They're kind of sketchy. They're low budget, generally speaking, 99% of them that you find on Amazon or the web are from China, and they are poorly constructed and they are underrated. And what I mean by that is this particular relay I have spec'd out is for 40 amps continuous AC load. 
when you look into this, it turns out that these low budget solid state relays are really not actually capable of holding 40 amps. Most of them only have a 20 or an 18 amp SRC or a solid state uh, rectifier inside of the unit itself. So they're only capable of sustaining about 15 or 18 amps. So this is important. Um, if you were to get an SRC 20, for example, and thinking that it was able to sustain 20 amps, if it's one of these lower budget or lower quality ones, chances are it's using a less capable device, so it's probably not even capable of 20 amps. These particular ones that I have, I have tested them. I have uh, run them through their paces on a variety of different uh, inputs and outputs. Uh, they seem to function just well under full load, uh, full load being about 15 to 18 amps or so continuous. They do get a little bit warm, but that is expected. That is why we have some heat sinks on them. So I've chosen devices here that are capable of 40 amps by spec, uh, even though I'm only gonna run no more than 20 amps through them, just in case they are inferior in some manner or fashion, um, to give me that extra headroom just to guarantee that the, the device itself should be capable of holding the load that I wanna run through it. So what else do we have on the inside here? Well, on the left and the right hand sides, pointing at the heat sinks for these solid state relays are some fans. I will control the RPM and the speed of those fans using the microcontroller. The microcontroller I have integrated with some temperature sensors and the temperature sensors will be attached to the solid state relays. So whenever they heat up and they reach a certain temperature, uh, you know, probably around 30 degrees Celsius all the way up to 40 uh, degrees Celsius or so, I will ramp the fans up. If they get above 45 degrees Celsius, that's a little bit of danger zone for these this particular unit um, and there's not a whole lot I can do to control the overall heat given the volume of the air that's coming in um, I've done some testing in passive uh, passive testing, which means um, just them sitting out in the open air with no active cooling and they did not get beyond 45 degrees running a 25, uh, 1200 watt heater run, running through them, which is very much equivalent to the shop vac in about half the current that the spindle would actually take. So I feel comfortable that these units are gonna operate uh, fine under the load that I'm using them for, as well as the fans are going to circulate enough air to keep them cool enough. It'll keep them, you know, kind of within spec for where they are. What else is in the inside? Well, we have a uh, power supply here. This is a five volt power supply, so it takes the AC in uh, and it actually just creates five volts to drive the solid state relays. So the solid state relays take anywhere between three and 32 volts in to activate them. And then they can switch anywhere from 24 to 240 volts AC on the load side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the microcontroller and an IO expansion port to control all of these peripherals off of the microcontroller. And then that five volt will drive not only the microcontroller, but the relays and all of the LEDs that are within the system, which require about you know, about three volts or so uh, to drive all the LEDs at, you know, quote unquote, full brightness. All right, well, that was a basic run through of the design and what's inside the design itself. You will see here that it is generally just a box. I will tell you that uh, I have used a large number of fasteners to attach all of the features to each other. You can see here, there's all those screws that I used to hold it together. So generally what I have here is a series of M3, M4, and M5 nuts that hold the unit together. Most of them are flush mount, as you can see from the sides here. I will rotate this around. You can see they are intended to be flush with the outside. So I chamfer the inside of these holes to make sure that they sit flush. There's a small number of them that I could not find a, a tapered input on. So you can see here in the bottom, they are just flat mounted here. I will turn the bottom on and show you that. So they just attach straight to the face. Now these are low profile uh, bolts in this case, uh, so they don't sit too far proud of the surface. So it's not a big deal. Um, but other than that, it's just pretty straightforward. Now I will say during the construction of the box itself, I chose not to tap each one of the individual holes. That was a mistake. This entire unit was made out of HDPE, which is fairly soft. And I thought just by uh, running a pilot hole in and then running the bolt into the hole, it would essentially self tap itself. And in, I would say about 80% of the cases, 
that actually worked very well. It went pretty well. Uh, there were a handful of cases, though, where the bolt uh, just wouldn't uh, grab onto the HDPE and it ended up essentially melting it, and so now the bolts are all stripped. And so that's unfortunate, and I need to figure out a way to get around that now that the box is essentially assembled. And as, when I do the final touches of the assembly, I'll have to dig into that. So if you are going to make this assembly, I would recommend tapping the holes appropriately by doing a pilot hole and using an actual three or four or five millimeter tap. Um, if I were to do this again, I would certainly do that. It's a little bit of extra time. It's a little bit of extra pain, uh, but it'll ultimately end up with a design that is gonna be significantly more robust and just hold itself together better. Now, I haven't had any issues right now with what I have done, so you can certainly do what I have done, um, but I would definitely say that it would be much more smooth assembling it if you were to tap these holes up front. All right, well, that was the design. I hope you liked it. It's fairly straightforward. It's got four main control areas. Uh, it's got some AC in, it's got some solid state relays. Uh, so it's a little complicated in that regard. I did throw in a microcontroller, which happens to have Wi-Fi on it. So I can control this wirelessly if I want to do that in the future. You do not have to do that. You certainly can just hardwire everything and it should work just fine. But in my case, you know, ultimately, I I have automated a good portion of my office, so it made sense for me to throw that extra Wi-Fi module in there and add a little extra software to make it work the way that I think ultimately I want it to work. But in the end, you know, it's fairly simple, like I said, so hopefully it'll work out. Um, I've already built most of the module here. I just haven't finished it yet, as I mentioned earlier. So in this case, I'm going to wrap up this video with this kind of overview of the design. I'm going to get back to building it and finishing it, getting it installed over here. And then I will show you in hopefully in the next video, the final assembled unit. I will walk you through a little bit of the montage of the building process, although not too much because I'm not entirely sure that the fast forwarding through the build process is terribly useful. I'm interested in your thoughts and your opinions on this. If you like the uh, speeding through the design with the uh, kind of voiceover, uh, please let me know in the comments if you like that. That would be helpful input. Uh, and if you don't like it, well, certainly provide your feedback as well. I think that, uh, you know, kind of walking through the design in detail is a little bit more informative maybe than just speeding through a design build process with a little bit of a voiceover, but that's my personal opinion. All right, well, thank you so much for getting this far. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you like the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, well, I would appreciate a thumbs up anyway, but leave your comments down below. Tell me why, so we can make future videos better. If you're not already following me on Instagram, please consider doing so. That's where I post pictures of projects like this to become future videos. All right, once again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for getting this far. And don't forget to be inspired. Uh, but then where I want to put it over here on the wall, or at least on my bench, turns out that this is how much space I have. So I had to basically start over, redesign it to be long and narrow instead of a kind of more squarish or more, um, uh, you know, with more... Instead of it being square. <laughs> Whatever we want to call that. <laughs> All right, so starting in the front panel here, first they do get a little bit warm, but that is expected. That is why we have some heat sinks on them. Um, so by overspecking these by 50%, as it turns out, well, I guess we're overspecking them by 100%. <laughs> we're doubling uh, the amount of current that they should be able to uh, take uh, by <clears throat> So effectively, by overspecking these particular devices, we are doubling the amount of current. Um, now what do I want to say? By purchasing some, <clears throat> by purchasing devices that are spec for 40 amps, but we know that are not capable of 40 amps. I believe that the 15 to 20 amps that I'm going to put through them should be more than sufficient, even though they are, generally speaking, in... <clears throat> I don't want to say that, so what do I want to say? So 
So I specifically chosen the 40 amp devices here to allow that extra headroom just in case of the devices that are actually inside of these stall state radiators. <clears throat> so I've, <clears throat> so I've saw, oh my God. So I've chosen devices here that are capable of 40 amps by spec, uh, even though I'm only gonna run no more than 20 amps through them, just in case they are inferior in some manner or fashion. 